Hey, QED coders, Michael L. Perry here. What would software be like if we never destroyed data? Well, that's kind of an odd question. I mean, you think? I am a software developer, and I don't destroy data, so what are you talking about? Well, have you ever written a delete statement? Okay, yeah, obviously delete statements destroy data. Well, what about an update statement? If you think about it, an update statement replaces the data that used to be in a row with some new data. So the data that used to be there is unrecoverable, is destroyed. Update statements destroy data. So what would software be like if you never wrote any delete statements, never wrote any update statements? All you could do is insert. Well, if we were to write software that way, we would have some really interesting capabilities. It would be really easy to synchronize between nodes. I mean, if data is in one node but not in another, all we have to do is insert that data into the other, and they're up to date. You would also have a permanent audit log of everything that's happened in your system. All the data would be there. So would it be possible to write enterprise software systems using only inserts, no updates, no deletes? Well, actually, I have devoted a lot of my career to doing just that. I use a technique that I call historical modeling in order to analyze and build software systems. This channel is all about historical modeling. I'm going to teach you some of the techniques that I use in order to analyze and build software systems using historical modeling. And I'll also show you some open source projects that have built Correspondence and Janaga that really help make historical modeling part of your application development lifecycle. But first, before we get into all that, I want to define for you what is a historical model. And to show you that, let's contrast a historical model with a traditional relational model. So here we have a software system that is an ordering system built using a relational database. So we've got our order table, and we've got order lines associated with that order, and then we've got shipments and payments. So whenever an order is shipped, we're going to capture things like the tracking number and the address to which the order was shipped. When we receive payment for that order, we'll keep track of the amount and the payment method. So we've got all that information in our relational database. Notice right here we also have a status column on the order. And so what we traditionally do in your typical database application is whenever something changes within the system and you want to update the status of the order, you just go ahead and update this column right here. So what are the different statuses the order can be in? For that, let's take a look at a state transition diagram. So in this state transition diagram for the ordering system, we're going to begin in the placed state. We're going to place the order. And then after we pick, pack, and ship the order, then we're going to transition into the shipped state. And then finally, when we receive payment from the client, we'll transition into the paid state. So we've got these different state transitions. Every time we transition the state, we're going to go back to our relational database and update this column. So that's a traditional method for building these enterprise software systems. Now, whenever we're updating the status, notice that something changes that we're also inserting a shipment because we've just shipped the order. We're also inserting a payment because we've just received payment. So we're updating the status and inserting a child record. That's actually redundant, right? I don't need to do both of those things. I should be able to figure out what the status of this order is by just looking for those child records. So if I have an order record, but no payments and no shipments, then I know that the order has been placed. It's in the placed state. If I see that the order has a shipment record, but no payment, then I know that it's been shipped. And if the order has a shipment and a payment, I know it's been paid. So I can use the existence of these child records to figure out the status of the order. This may be familiar to you if you've heard of something called event sourcing. Now, event sourcing and historical modeling are pretty similar, but they have one big difference, and that's the ordering of those events. In event sourcing, we've got an event stream, so we've got a fully ordered series of events. In historical modeling, we just have a relationship between these objects, and so we just have a partial order of events. We'll see why a partial order can help us to solve some really interesting problems. I'll go into some of the differences between event sourcing and historical modeling in a later video. But for right now, let's go ahead and dive into 
historical modeling with a relational database. In the next video, we're going to be talking about how we can use foreign keys in the relational database in order to keep track of these relationships between historical facts. So come on back. <laughs>